OK, we look like we've got a, a, a fair moment of peace. So um, hopefully we've got most people in the room that are expecting to, to come to the talk. Thank you very much for joining us for this Institution of Mechanical Engineers free talk um, on the impact of robotics and AI. This talk is being given by uh, Dr. Theo Theodiris. Uh, from the University of Salford. He's a reader here in the School of um, Science, Engineering and Environment. And um, I hope you all enjoy it. Over to you, Theo. Hi, thank you, Georgina. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone, um, and Happy New Year. Um, I hope you're well and thanks for joining my talk tonight. Um, as Georgina said, my name is Theo. I'm a, a reader here in Salford. And uh, in this presentation, I will uh, focus on uh, how robotics and AI has impacted the world and uh, the various industries. Um, I will uh, try to keep this presentation at high level with a little reference and details in the underlying methodologies, although I cannot really avoid that in, in some cases. Uh, which these methodologies are actually being used in the fields of AI and robotics, which I believe you will find uh, interesting. Um, also, I'd like to make this talk interactive. So if there is any very, very urgent question, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, I'll try to respond. The impact of uh, robotics and AI. Right, so let's start with a little bit of uh, Salford and what we have in the labs. Uh, I, I believe that will be very interesting to our students if they're joining tonight this session. So um, in 1987, Salford was announced as the National Robotics Research Center, and um, I believe that was due to the larger uh, amount of research outputs and prototype robot developments at that time. Probably you have seen some of the videos like I have. Uh, uh, it was um, enormous to what uh, sort of developments have been done by that time. Uh, although the videos are old, you can see some very innovative robots and uh, systems. Uh, and uh, this is something that the roboticists in Salford continued actually until today. As you can see in those pictures, the Salford Robotics Labs vary from uh, intelligent environments, as you can see up here, it's what we call the living lab, to industrial and mobile robots, as well as autonomous vehicles hosted in, in the autonomous and automotive vehicle technology laboratory, as you can see down here, the AAVT. And um, our robot facilities are used uh, for both research and teaching with a variety of projects based on AI methods uh, used to solve real life problems. For example, in the Living Lab, some of the major AI projects were on um, service and interactive robots like Carebot. Um, other projects uh, were related to human action recognition and monitoring system for detecting human status and falls. Also projects on ubiquities and uh, network sensors for monitoring the state of the environment using virtual uh, avatars and, and much, much more. Uh, here are some of the robots I built since 2013. As you can see, there are over 20 platforms that are being used for research and teaching. Uh, for example, for the ones at the back, the more bigger ones, you can see research platforms used in research projects, uh, school demos, open days and demonstrations for industrial collaborations. Uh, the front robot platforms I have built for undergraduate teaching projects are related to embedded systems, mechatronics and AI. So there is a, a huge variety of uh, robots to play with in Salford. And um, I'd like to start with a little bit of uh, a, a very gentle actually introduction on AI because it's becoming a trend nowadays. It's um, uh, everybody's talking about it, but uh, maybe little uh, know that it's not something new. So what is AI actually? So AI or artificial intelligence uh, is not new. It dates back uh, in the 60s where the first AI algorithms were introduced to the world uh, using primitive computers and hardware. Uh, nowadays, AI has gained uh, popularity, I believe, due to the deep learning, okay, which is a subclass of machine learning which is a subclass of uh, classical AI. And I will introduce some of these concepts later and the impact in the society and the industry. So to take that note on the top right, AI studies software 
or embodied agents or robots, in other words, that first perceive their environment and take actions to maximize their success. One classical AI problem where software or robot agents have been trying to solve over the years is the maze learning problem, which is a very nice educational problem as well. And uh, one of the most classical machine learning methodologies or subclass of AI is the one called the reinforcement learning, RL. Okay, so reinforcement learning is inspired from nature and the way humans and animals learn. For example, you reward your dog with a cookie, yeah, if he sits when you command him to do, right? And you punish him, for example, if he barks or messes around. So uh, computer scientists uh, engineered this behavior, and we have many branches of this uh, type of uh, AI paradigms, and enable now robots or agents to perceive their environment from sensors and apply actions in it by using a policy criterion, as is the core of this uh, machine learning branch, the reinforcement learning, which this criterion actually aims to drive the robot to the exit of the maze. And if not, then the whole route of actions is being evaluated with punishments and rewards. So in the next iteration, to do better. And that's how it works. The majority of, uh, from low to high, very high level AI methods are based on this kind of concept. We have an agent that perceives something from its environment, processes it and performs some action to maximize a success criterion, a cost criterion, if I put it better. And um, there are seven areas, major areas of AI that uh, I can uh, classify here. Uh, first is the knowledge representation, and this mainly reflects on how agents or robots perceive their world. And it makes sense because we do something similar. For example, when we see a human being or a dog yeah, or an object or a car, we do not focus on the details or, or how um, wide uh, the head is or how tall he is. Uh, it's more abstract and very discreet. And this is how uh, computer programs can now see through computer vision uh, when we model some object, uh, whether this is a human being or a, or a dog or an object. So for a human being, for example, what we see is a, an oval head, a cylindrical torso and limbs to represent the human. Uh, so we discretize this knowledge. We present it as a discrete cylindrical shapes in this case, so that to be able to recognize what it is. Uh, the second one is uh, related natural language uh, understanding, and this uh, mainly has applications on uh, intelligent conversational agents, also known as chatbots, that use natural language processing from artificial speech, as well as voice recognition and voice synthesis. And uh, these agents are able to understand verbal commands and the syntax of a specific language, for example, English in this case. The third one is about learning, and it is referring to the branches of machine learning that is a subclass of AI. And uh, like the one I described earlier, the reinforcement learning, uh, other branches of uh, machine learning are evolutionary algorithms, neural networks, and so on. And uh, agents use these methods to learn from experience, imitation, or demonstration, which is one of the core areas of AI and the most popular ones used nowadays. Uh, the fourth one is referring to the inference, and uh, this is the process of drawing conclusions from data with a random variation. And um, agents normally use or generate answers based on those concepts when there is incomplete information, very useful in the statistical inference or statistical learning. The next one is search, such as data mining, and uh, this refers to agents that efficiently examine knowledge, representation of a problem. Uh, in other words, they exhaustively search a space of solution or, or the landscape, as we call it, to find solution for a given problem. The next one is uh, about computer vision and is referring to robots or agents that understand and learn environments, uh, like I described earlier. And there are several computer vision algorithms. Again, in this case, uh, I would refer only to the basic ones, like the blob coloring is a method to identify or segment an image to specific color regions. And then we can tell what these regions are, whether it's a ball, it's a human or whatever else, it's a flaw. Uh, optical flow refers to the uh, derivative of motion in, in an image. So we can tell at uh, which direction maybe a human is waving to or something like that. Template matching is a method that enables a computer program to identify a particular object in an image that is based on, on an existing ground truth object. And stereo vision can provide depth information to a robot. 
Um, and the final one is referring to planning and problem solving. And um, these are some of the very classical AI paradigms that uh, I will describe some of them later. And this area enables agents to plan actions and accomplish some goal. Some of the most popular ones are the hierarchical and the hybrid paradigms, as well as the assumption architecture that I, I will also talk later in the slide, and uh, the A-star planning algorithm. Right. In this slide, I'd like to show you uh, Shaky, which was the first robot that had uh, embodied artificial intelligence. And its development started from 1966 and uh, lasted up to 1972. So I will play the video to see what was that about. Shaggy was the world's first mobile I'd like to talk uh, in the background about it. In artificial intelligence, so like I said, Shaggy was the world's first robot to embody artificial intelligence. It, it could perceive its surroundings. It could also logically deduce uh, implicit facts from, from other explicit ones, navigate uh, from place to place and make uh, plans uh, to achieve a goal. Also, it could monitor the execution of a plan in the real world and recover from errors when running or executing a plan, as well as improving its planning abilities through learning and even communicate in simple English. It had so many features that most of the nowadays robots could, <laughs> could, could be jealous of. So Shaky was the um, first and most advanced robot of its era and kept its title for many decades, actually. And the major problem Shaky had was extremely slow based on its very, very old hardware and the large amount of hours or even days that it needed to compute or execute something. About its sensors, it's very interesting because all of its sensors were custom made and developed by researchers along with software interfaces to access them. For example, Shaky had Will encoder sensors, bump detectors, a single Polaroid range finder like Sony sensors your cars have, yeah, our cars have, and an analog TV camera. This is for computer sciences and uh, computer vision experts. It's just abnormal. It needs, I don't know what sort of uh, programming skills to access an analog camera and do uh, anything with it, actually. Another note on shaky software and the architecture and algorithms created, uh, I'd like to say that they created a legacy at that time that influenced more than the design of today's robots. For example, when your phone computes your driving directions or when your car warns you when you're veering uh, out of your lane or when a character moves in a video game, uh, when the Curiosity Mask Rover Autonomous Navigator out obstacle and all those features and technologies Techniques first developed and used it was by Shake. It was such an advanced mobile platform and it revolutionized the AI robotics we know today. Also, uh, one of the main components that, uh, as you can see in the video, was inherited by uh, the next generation robots was the division software that was able to extract regions and lines from TV images, like I mentioned earlier, captured by an analog camera. And uh, as shown in, in these images, it used like a sort of a region analysis method to perceive its surroundings and navigate around obstacles or make plans. It was just a, a revolution at that time. And as you can see, yeah, in, in modern days now, all these robots have uh, inherited. Shaky's uh, breakthrough uh, in computer vision is now used to help drivers stay in their lanes. And every time you get driving directions on your phone or a navigation, you are benefiting from the A star navigation algorithm first invented for Shaky. Even NASA's Mars Exploration Rovers use navigational techniques that were first launched with Shaky. The future is things like potentially having uh, teams of uh, autonomous aircraft that could go out, for example, and do firefighting and doing this either fully autonomously or potentially in tandem with human piloted aircraft that can and this goes on and on, like the uh, range of applications vary and uh, there are so many projects that uh, not just university projects as shaky was, but uh, commercial projects and robots that uh, are using the, these techniques. So I'd like to move to the next slide now and uh, start with classical AI and uh, agents. It's all thanks to Alan Turing, who was uh, and still actually he is considered as the father of computer science and artificial intelligence. As you know, mainly for his work uh, in the so-called the Turing machine, uh, which was published in 1965. 
His work was a mathematical or computational model that uh, defined uh, an abstract machine which uh, was able to manipulate symbols on a strip or, or, or of a tape according to a table of rules. Now, in recent years, we have seen an actual implementation of this idea in symbolic regression performed by genetic programming alg algorithms used to evolve solutions for a given problem. I have personally used uh, uh, symbolic regression in my PhD and genetic programming, and I can tell you that this technique was uh, extremely powerful and it worked very well. I have actually a slide later on, on this. The Turing machine is regarded as a simple model which can be given or described by any computer algorithm, like I said, the symbolic regression, and it is capable of simulating and constructing the algorithm's logic. So aging technology or software agents, like I mentioned earlier, have been using this idea as a ground-based concept. And a popular application can be seen in the conversational agents, also known as chatbots, as mentioned also earlier, where a more abstract or simplified architecture of those can be described as a simple uh, reflexed agent, as you can see here. So in the chatbot scenario, by using this uh, simple reflex agent, uh, imagine that a variable or a string request is inputted into the agent and a command is being processed by a rule base or a higher level heuristic algorithm, which could be any approach or method to problem solving or self discovery for the agent by employing a practical method that is not guaranteed to be optimal or perfect or, 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 or even rational. Actually, the rule base is being used to process efficiently inputs received by the environment, but it would need a ground truth algorithm or a knowledge base or a world model so as to compare what the agent is being perceiving via its senses and versus the norms of the real world. So in order to use this rule base, we need to have a ground truth, like I said, or a world model to compare what is being perceived by the environment in order to produce an action. Uh, finally, as the simple reflex agent algorithm uh, describes on the right hand side here, the action is generated and applied in the environment and uh, the action can take actually any form which can vary from a simple text or verbal response, which could be a set of directives or physical interaction if we have a, a physical robot. And an extension of this idea, Turing's idea, I would say, because it resembles very much what Turing described, is uh, seen by uh, Rodney Brooks on his work, the some assumption architectures and the finite, augmented finite state machines. So in 1986, uh, Rodney Brooks introduced this concept of uh, augmented finite state machines, which is a behavioral paradigm that can be applied in software agents and robots. And... Um, to be honest, it, it uh, reminiscence the symbolic regression of Turing's idea, but in this case, a finite state machine is elaborated more in the internal structure. And according to Brooks, if, if we have a, an abstract network of uh, finite state machines, as you can see here, we can form a assumption network or a assumption architecture, which is a, a layer-based stratification, as you can see in this example. We have various layers where the finite state machines are being distributed. And um, each finite state machine can hold robot behaviors that can be resetted. As you can see, there is a reset module here. Can accept on inhibit input data. As you can see, the inputs have uh, straight connections to the behavior or can be, in be inhibited by other behaviors, as well as can be pass or suppress output commands that this FSM may, uh, may have to give out. So the assumption architecture was uh, mainly used, as you can see in this video from MIT. All Rodney Brooks robots were based on, on this architecture and was used mainly to model animal behaviors and had an impact in the field of biologically inspired robotics back in the 80s. And this was ranging from uh, mobile and autonomous guided vehicles, forward and side walking legged robots, uh, insect bots, and swimming agents. Uh, so the some assumption architecture actually is able to model everything. For example, take a look on this architecture here on my right, which is a basic navigation architecture consisting of an escape layer, an exploration la layer, and a, an avoid layer. So imagine if we have this as a ground base and on the top we'll build multiple layers to implement, for example, a biologically inspired behavior, which is the foraging behavior. Right, So we can enable a robot to, to go, get some food, uh, avoid enemies and come back home. So 
we have to make various assumptions on this architecture, like uh, the food for the robot might be some charging facility. The enemies could be some uh, sharp walls or some sort of an abstraction environment, which the robot has to deal with. And one of the main reasons of developing this architecture, uh, Brooks, was to uh, be able to tell to the world, like, if one layer fails, for example, if this escape layer fails, the other layers could still contribute for the completion of a task, which brought an impact in the area of autonomous robots because simply these finite state machines could run in different computers or different processes, which is extremely useful. If you think, for example, it wouldn't be applied on a mass rover at the very low level, but at a high level, having more robust behavioral algorithms in it, you can imagine that if you send a robot in Mars and uh, some sort of a module fails, then the whole mission is wasted. So this whole architecture gives an idea on how to save a mission by having a stratification of layers. In this case, this avoid layer could help uh, having a, a runaway behavior that can uh, trigger a forward motion, another behavior that enables a forward motion of the robot. The exploration layer can enable a wonder behavior, which could be an algorithm that enables the robot to take random maneuvers. And this can suppress the runaway behavior if an exploration is enabled. And how exploration is enabled, based on what sensor inputs you see here, all these input lines are the sensors that are being perceived uh, in all these uh, FSMs. And in, in the escape layer, again, as you can see, the escape layer evaluates whether a collision is identified. And uh, based on this, if the robot is lost, again, in the escape layer, it should reverse and enable the navigation layer, the avoid layer. So they, still the robot will function if some of them are damaged. So uh, it looks like pretty useful and it worked for, for many, many years and still it still works actually. Nowadays we can have uh, like an advanced machine learning or deep learning algorithm running in all these boxes. And this is just a high level interpretation of how a robot architecture could be to function properly. It's like organizing the logic uh, or the overall logic of how a robot needs to move and think. So apologies, but it's going to be like a rain of information. Maybe many of these things are new for you, but uh, I believe you will find them interesting uh, after the videos I will be showing to you. This is very interesting. Evolutionary algorithms is again another branch of um, uh, machine learning, which a machine learning, like I said, is a subclass of uh, artificial intelligence. And um, the pioneer in evolutionary algorithms was obviously Charles Darwin with his uh, work in 1859, The Origin of the Species. So evolutionary algorithms, like I said, branch of machine learning, it's purely based on Darwin's theory of evolution as he, he described on his book. It's interesting, right? Because if I told you that um, programs can mate, but using sexual reproduction, uh, would it be too crazy for you to believe? Or yes, but it's true because it happens actually. And it is the fundamental operation of this class of methods, also known as genetic algorithms. And um, in their most classical or simple form, we use genetic algorithms or genetic programming. Actually, let me show you how this happens. It's all based on natural selection. So based on Darwin's theory, everything comes down as a, a population or an initial population. Populations are being described as uh, anything like humans, trees, flowers, uh, animals, anything. Could In this case, our population is a bunch of algorithms. It could be computer programs, uh, it could be for loops, uh, it could be anything. And uh, this population is randomly initialized and undergo through an evaluation process or a fitness assignment. So this fitness evaluation is applied to every individual in the population. In this case, we have programs or alg algorithms like I said. Let's keep the algorithms idea. Right, so all these algorithms have been evaluated and are being assigned by some sort of a, uh, a fitness percentage, which the higher it is, the, the better the fitness or the better this algorithm solves a particular problem. And this actually fitness, I'd like to say, is the pressure the environment applies on these algorithms. For example, in a natural environment, uh, like let's say in nature outside, right, uh, what is a, a pressure that is being applied to an individual? A natural pressure could be temperature, right? Could be weather conditions. 
that uh, the more resistant an individual is to those conditions, it will survive and it will go through to the next generation, right? So it's the same here. The fitness has been assigned to all individuals and undergo through a natural selection, which is picking parents from these initial population based on how good their fitness is. And uh, after selecting parents or individual programs or algorithms, then we go through the genetic operators, which is the sexual recombination or the mutation operations. Okay, and after mating these individuals, it sounds crazy, I know, but it happens. So after mating these programs or these algorithms, we have a new breed of a population of offsprings, actually, that have a new genetic material that can withstand to those pressures as applied from the fitness and can obviously have uh, managed to go through the next population. And for the ones that are weaker, just die. So the weaker algorithms just vanish. And um, this uh, final population, it's just one iteration, what I described, goes through a criteria satisfaction, which could be how good the top individual in the population is, or how many generations, as we call them, as in nature, have we been through. And if these two criteria are not satisfied, then we go through a second generation and a third, and it could last for hundreds or thousands of iterations, of tens of thousands of iterations, until when we get some good result, which is an algorithm uh, picked from this initial population that has evolved uh, so much that can solve a problem now. Like if we see that in more details, imagine that we have in genetic algorithms, right? We have three individuals. You can see here their genetic material. Imagine that these digits uh, represent their DNA. So this is the genetic code, right, of these individuals. And uh, the first step is to measure the fitness, right, to evaluate the, their goodness. So the first gets a 13, 0.4 and 33%, yeah. Then they will undergo some uh, sort of a natural selection. So what we do is we use a, a technique called the roulette wheel where we select uh, individuals at random and based on their fitness partially. So from this natural selection process, let's say that these two parents have been selected for the reproduction phase. And in this case, we had three. We selected randomly the yellow and the green. OK, now these undergo sexual recombination. And you can see this here. What happens here is they have just crossed over their genetic material. In other words, their genotype has changed now, as you can see, because this one that was down here in green has now moved here. And this zero that was up here has now just moved down here. So you see a, a crossover operation applied here. OK, and the next action is the mutation, which at random, we choose one individual and one digit from this genotype to swap it to something else. For example, we pick the first one from the yellow individual and we change it to from one to zero. That's our final population after one generation. Hopefully it is better than the first one. And the process goes through again and again. And as an application, as an interesting application, I'd like to show you a video from my PhD, which I have used exactly, or at least a similar methodology, on action classification for human modeling on aggressive behaviors for mobile robot surveillance. So we have a robot that can uh, see people who are aggressive, evaluate their physical status by using biomechanics, and pass all that into a genetic programming algorithm which was able to evolve solutions on recognizing if someone is aggressive or not. And to do that, I had to go through normal, evaluate normal and uh, aggressive actions so that the algorithm was able to make this distinction. As you can see here, the first set is a set of normal actions and then a set of aggressive actions. This is very quick and descriptive. Uh, but it worked, actually. The algorithm managed to evolve uh, programs for the robot that could recognize what aggression is, and then the robot could see that and identify aggression. And once it was done that, it could approach the individual and to give some uh, guidelines. That was all about evolutionary algorithms. And uh, let's move on now to the uh, next one, which is a machine learning paradigm based on Bayesian learning, which is extremely popular in robotics. So in probability theory and statistics, Bayes theorem uh, named by Thomas Bayes describes the probability of an event 
when a prior knowledge of conditions that might be related to an event occurs. So the Bayesian learning is a method of uh, statistical inference in which the Bayes theorem is being used to update the probability of, of a hypothesis as a more evidence of information becomes available. For example, a derivative of this theorem, the recursive Bayesian estimation, also known as the Bayes filter, which is a, a general probabilistic approach for estimating uh, an unknown probability density function recursively, and over time using incoming measurements as a mathematical process model. So in robotics, a Bayes filter is an algorithm used to calculate these probabilities of multiple beliefs, thus allowing a robot to refine its position and orientation, and it's extremely popular in robot localization, this method. So essentially, uh, what a Bayes filter does is to allow robots to continuously update their most likely position based on a coordinate system and the most recently acquired sensory data. So an extension of this uh, Bayesian or probabilistic filter is what we know as the particle filter, also known as the Monte Carlo localization. These two are uh, nearly the same. Uh, which this algorithm is being used, as you can see here, for a robot localization and mapping. And it is uh, actually the signature for the area of uh, SLAM, the simultaneous localization and mapping. Particle filters are widely used on this method. So a particle filter initially requires a map, like you see here, a map. It's a ground plan uh, view of a room. So it requires a map of the robot's environment in order to estimate the position and the orientation of the robot as it moves and it senses the environment. And to do that, the algorithm uses a distribution of uh, likely states, each particle representing a possible state, which is a hypothesis of where the robot is. So if I told you that we have a physical robot and uh, in order to know where it is, we have to send these robots around the room w without actually moving it, would you believe me? But yes, it sounds again uh, impossible to physically send the robot around, but this is remarkable. This is the idea behind the Monte Carlo localization we spread out a density of particles, a distribution of particles, which are just copies of the physical robot, but we send these particles, not in the real world, but in the robot's brain, in the robot's computer that is on board. And uh, what, it, what these virtual particles do, they try to understand wh where they are in, in reference or in comparison to the actual robots, and they implement a probabilistic, I would call it, triangulation to tell that yes, you are at this X, Y, and theta uh, pose or, loca or physical location. And this is actually how this algorithm represents uh, this concept. So we have a physical robot. This is the simulated version of the robot, but there is a sti still a real robot behind this, if you understand what I mean. So the real robot and the simulated robot run both at the same time in real time. So having these two simulated and real robots, so the simulated robot helps to spread this particle density around and make comparisons. And as we move on on the algorithm and we update the sensory and motion model and the kinematics of this robot, all these parts, as described in the algorithm, all these particles are updated at the same time. And as you can see, smaller densities of blobs are being created, as you can see here, which means that the robot knows better and better where it is. And after a very quick you know, period of time, the robot knows exactly where it is based on the particle density that is being formed now around it. This circle is the error. The radius of this circle signifies the error of the density. And as the robot slightly moves, the kinematics and everything else is updated in both sides, physical and, and simulated robot, to eventually come down to an extremely small error, saying that, yes, now I know where I am. Let me show you how this algorithm actually had a huge impact in the industry. Let me show you first again a nice video of Monte Carlo localization algorithm I developed around 10 years ago. This runs also in a Pioneer robot. Here you see only the simulated side of it. Obviously, you cannot see the real representation of it because there are no real particles around the robot. These are all simulated. But there is a real robot behind this actually that it moves as this moves. You see, uh, initially, the particle density is being spread around the environment at random. 
these particles need to be everywhere so to know where eventually the robot is and see how quickly the density converges around where the robot is. So this little red circle uh, represents the uh, simulated robot and the, this line is the heading. As you can see, as the robot moves, and turns, the density erroneously has been created here, formed here, but as it moves, it starts knowing where, where it is. And you can see now the density is around the simulated robot, which tells the real robot that, yes, I know where I am, just go ahead. Okay, and as it moves again, you see the particles are in, continuously updated and evaluate dynamically the real robot state. Wherever the robot goes, compares the particles with the map locations, like, remember that all the particles have exactly the same properties in terms of kinematics and sensor models. And here you can see how this exact technique can be used for mapping. Uh, this is another robot that runs in a lab environment. And uh, you can see as it navigates around, uh, it uses this Monte Carlo localization and particle filtering to robustly draw a map, uh, create or generate a map, and eventually perform a loop closure. It's just so accurate, yeah? It's one of the best algorithms in robotics and see now how this has impacted the industry. So the impact was obviously in the intelligent logistics. You can see now everywhere smart factories having intelligent mobile robots, autonomous robots, autonomous platforms running around on different environments. Omron is one of the ones existing in the uh, Japanese market. And uh, as you can see, by using this SLAM technique, this particle filter, Monte Carlo localization, it can autonomously move around without the use of uh, magnetic strips. From the US market, we see another company that is uh, specializing on uh, lifting these weights. Uh, and from the European market, we see the Mir Industries, uh, which they deploy robots for dragging objects around by using, again, the same localization method I described earlier. And finally, in Asian countries, we see the Milvus Robotics, again, uh, specializing on mobile conveyors, which is, again, a brilliant idea. Most of the companies now actually embraced and uh, and use it. As you can see, this is a mobile conveyor that can take all these objects around uh, autonomously by again using this Monte Carlo method and uh, transport them safely in warehouses. And let's move to the next one that is uh, one of the main slides, I would say, dedicated on deep learning. I'd like to start with the uh, artificial neural networks, uh, as you probably heard, uh, or simply the uh, neural networks that are computing models inspired by the biological neural networks that constitute or resemble human or animal brain. So the first most popular neural network was the perceptron, as I described here, invented by Frank Rosenblatt in 1958, which is a linear combination of weights, as you can see here, and sensory inputs given by a sum of products. So a perceptron is said to abstractly describe biological neuron, and it is used as an algorithm for supervised learning of uh, binary linear classifiers, which can decide whether or not an input uh, represented by a vector numbers belong to some specific class. I will show you later what, what I mean by a linear representation of, uh, of a model. So an extension of our perception was made with an introduction of a backpropagation algorithm, as you can see, given by this little equation, which allows the auto adjustment of these uh, weight vector uh, given by some training example. In more complex structures of a perception, uh, which can be seen in a multi-layer perceptron networks, are used to model more complex problems. This little equation here also revolutionized the area of uh, neural networks as it can propagate back information exported by the network and to update the weights. As you can see here, this is original weight vector updated by the current weight vector plus some learning rate, an output value minus the linear combination from the perceptron. If we combine this backpropagation rule with multiple perceptrons here in a multi-layer perception architecture, we will not only have a binary classification of uh, recognition or objects, but we can have a much more arbitrary or complex structures being identified. If we have uh, just two classes, the data identified in cluster A 
and the data in cluster B. These could be vision data, spatial data, sound, time series, anything really. So with a single layer, we can only draw binary boundaries to recognize these classes, which is not efficient, as you can see. With a two-layer architecture, you can have a much more better classification by classifying uh, convex or open or closed regions. And with a much more complicated arbitrary architecture, like a three-layered architecture, you can get, you can even surround these uh, classes, these areas. So you can see how useful this is. But uh, the technique that has uh, really revolutionized machine learning and artificial intelligence is the convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks is uh, actually a deep learning or brain inspired technique uh, used to perform machine learning and problem solving mainly on images. And uh, as you can probably imagine, why we choose images to solve problems? Because it is apparently the most popular sensor for robotics, image classification, active vision, image restoration and colorization, object recognition. The applications are really endless. So the convolutional neural networks have uh, really brought this revolution in the area of machine learning. As you can see here, a convolutional neural network has like a normal neural network, an input and an output layer, and many hidden layers and millions of parameters that have the ability to learn complex objects and patterns. To learn something, it just subsamples the given input by convoluting or by using convolution or a pooling process, which is subject to an activation function used uh, by a final fully connected layer that results in the recognition of the output layer. So how this works, we have an original image and we use a kernel, which is simply another small image or a template that is being used to scan the image from the top left to the bottom right. Imagine that you have printed an A3, a big poster image. Let's say you have a poster in front of you. And you have um, a flashlight that you flash this light on the top left of this poster and you try to scan this over and over up to the bottom right of this poster. The same process takes place here. This kernel, yeah, this smaller image is scanning this original image and it produces a smaller dimensional image by this convolutional process. So convolutional will uh, scan all these pixels in the image and for every scan will multiply at each location its current position with the values that are being present in this kernel. If this image is a, a 640 by 480 standard resolution image, our kernel might be something like 10 by 10 pixels. So it is going to have its own values in it. These values could uh, represent a line, a color, a pattern of uh, some specific object could be from very low to a very high level. So once we scan that, we produce a derivative of this image, which is simply a feature image. And this feature image again is being convoluted and goes to the next level. That is again a second level of convolution. And for every layer of convolution, we can have different type of kernels that can identify patterns, as you can see here. So a very low type of kernel can identify simple edges, as you can see here. It could be straight lines, curves, circles, uh, multiple lines together. It could be uh, specific colors. And as you go on higher level of this uh, stratification of the, uh, this convolutional network, you have more feature maps that could recognize more advanced features such as a leg, a finger, a leaf, I don't know, a keyboard, anything the object could be. And this whole process now is being taken care of the convolutional network. In the classical neural networks, uh, we had to do all this process by ourselves if we had to process an image. So here everything is being taken care of by the network to eventually come down to a fully connected layer and a softmax activation function that is simply a classifier that matches a probability of classes or labels assigned to a specific class. Here we have, uh, as an example, uh, a class of only three objects and the classifier can now tell you which object is which by undertaking this whole process by itself. The feature extraction, classification and probabilistic distribution process all taken care of by the network. Uh, the only little work maybe we'll have to do is train this network, which is uh, a minimal work. 
OK, and annotating these training examples, for example, if in an image we want to say, OK, I want you to recognize the zebra, we have to annotate the image and draw a, a bounding box around the zebra to tell what a zebra is in the image and give like a few tens or hundreds of images to the system to be able to produce a more accurate results. Just to let you know that in traditional cases, uh, maybe a decade ago, I would say, we struggled to recognize up to five, six classes within a classifier system. Now, with deep learning and convolutional neural networks, we can classify thousands of objects with a super high accurate probability. And it's just amazing. But um, it is not only limited to this. I'd like to show you the actual impact of deep learning and those convolutional neural networks to see what we have actually. So I have a compilation of various different applications that I'd like to show you. First, uh, the impact of autonomous vehicles. And uh, first, I'd like to show you the very innovative Tesla's full self-driving system or FSD, which um, is being shown here. And uh, it's been released uh, to show what a Tesla, autonomous Tesla car sees in order to perform all this autonomous activity on the road. So the system is able of analyzing the speed of the cars ahead and it calculates the distance of those cars as well as uh, whether these cars are uh, on a safe distance from the car or not. Uh, it is also able to calculate the center of the car uh, that is ahead uh, and the amount of cars as being in a traffic scenario. It can see signs, uh, all sort of signs, like the stop sign, as you can see on the top. Uh, now you can see on the right and all sort of signs. So it can take the car can autonomously take actions based on what signs it sees. For example, if it sees a speed sign, the car obviously can auto adjust and uh, reduce the speed to the required speed based on what the sign sees. Uh, you see there the zebra strip there. Yeah, you can see that as well. It can automatically detect a wet road wet tires, rain on the road, the projection of high beams coming from incoming cars. Uh, it can see and perform lane detection and lane projection with lane keeping. And it can uh, read uh, pedestrian lines like we saw earlier the, and the traffic ahead. And um, this is only the view from one camera angle. Imagine if we had the view of all the cameras that exist around the car. Theo, so, apologies, yeah. just, just a little bit of a warning. We're at kind of three kind minutes past seven and we've got some questions coming in. Again. So um, um, apologies if you could try and um, get to the end of the talk so we can cover the questions. OK, I'll try to make it quick. Thank you, Georgina. Sorry about that. To quickly go through the impact of uh, deep learning in the entertainment industry, probably you have seen that, but if not, you right you now, will this find just it moments ago, as, the house as, votes as you can see here, deep learning is being used as a as a deep fake technique, and in this case, uh, researchers have trained generative neural network architectures in order to map or match a donor's face, in this case Donald Trump's, with a template face uh, given by Rowan Atkinson. The Here's results are really the remarkable. Here's what the president and said moments ago. About what? No, if people want to leave our country, they can. If they don't want to love our country, if they don't want to fight for our country, they can. Uh, I'll never change on that, no. Go to the next and uh, show you the concept of image colorization and restoration. I just wanted uh, to name this application also as image colorization and restoration because it is, but uh, it's more than that actually. I would describe this a little bit scary but remarkable at the same time as it looks like AI will be able to bring back our loved ones in some sense. Uh, and uh, I would, I'd like to leave this to you to see and enjoy this breathtaking application. It's really remarkable to see what uh, deep learning is capable of now. So this is how AI has uh, generated. Uh, it's just remarkable. Like, uh, and uh, the motion is actually real as it has uh, matched the, the, the template of a real human to, to show the motion. And we can see someone, someone from the past to respond so naturally uh, as being real, as being 
someone who is living with us today. See how she could look these days. It's just amazing. And you can see here uh, an algorithm you? developed by OpenAI called GPT-3. And here, this is a real life chatbot. This is a human that was uh, rendered as a chatbot using deep learning for the physical interaction as well as for the conversational part of it. And if you, unfortunately, we don't have time to show you uh, the AI response to some extremely random questions, you would be scared. It's really remarkable how deep learning has revolutionized this field. Okay, thank you, Theo. Uh, I don't think at this time of the evening we all want to be quite so scared. Uh, <laughs> but uh, everybody just uh, maybe unmute for a second and just give uh, Theo just a little bit of a round of applause. Okay, can you can you put your mute buttons back on, please? Um, I'm, I'm just going to address the questions, uh, Theo, if that's OK, in the uh, chat boxes before. Sure. I'm sure there's questions going to come from the floor as well. We have a question here from uh, the uh, chat box. What is the future role of robotics and how will it fulfill the human needs? Hi, thanks for the question. I think the, the future role of robotics, we, we can see it actually from now. I believe it, it is and it is going to be on service robotics by helping humans in several different sectors. And this can be seen, like I said, around the world from uh, the US, uh, Europe and Asian countries. There is a deployment of service robots in every single sector and this will continue uh, to grow exponentially. We see robots uh, in the hospitality industry for intelligent logistics, robots working in hotels, hospitals, restaurants, not yet uh, in this country, not much in Europe, but there is a, a massive wave, especially in Asian countries where, where these robots are, have been deployed. And I believe they will be part of us. And it's like everything. We see everything getting personalized. And in the near future, I believe we will have a robot or robot agents as personal robots, as we have now personal computers or phones next to us helping us. So I think it's something that is going to happen in the next uh, probably 15 years, I would say. OK, thanks. I think it's probably um, our acceptance. Uh, another question for you coming from the floor. What do you foresee as the next breakthrough? that will make autonomous robots more ambiguous. In terms of the, uh, uh, the automotive industry, I think the next revolution uh, or a breakthrough will be done there. Just because the industry is enormous and there is a lot of funds and it looks like the money is there or help this area to progress. And we will see some of the first autonomous robot taxis that will be taking us around autonomously Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a, another question, late question that's come in for in you, Theo. Uh, regarding uh, the Monte Carlo localization that you were talking about, is that used in autonomous cars? Thanks again for the question. No, it's not being used in cars. What it is currently being used in cars is the A star and Dijkstra's planning algorithm, as it is the same algorithm that is being used in sat navs for GPS navigation. These two planning algorithms actually were invented for the Shakey's project, and uh, they are still being used in sat-navs and autonomous cars. But um, the Monte Carlo is not being used simply because we have the stigma of the car from the satellite in an existing map. An existing map, I mean one of the available map interface APIs like, like the Google map. So we have already the stigma of where the car is. So the car is already localized and placed on the road. So we don't need this algorithm. But what we need is a planner, where to go and how. Okay, and I think um, 
a final question for for you, uh, Leo. And what, it's a personal question, I think, from the floor. What hope, hope do you have that uh, robotics will ha achieve in your lifetime? This requires a little bit of imagination as well. Uh, but uh, what I would anticipate to see is a little bit actually of what I mentioned earlier. I think everybody is uh, probably uh, thinking about having a personalized robot to help at home with everything. And it's really fascinating. And I would have hoped to see more robots uh, helping people that are in need, especially around the world. And uh, that would be my hope. And uh, that would be also my effort to contribute toward this area, like to potentially have or deploy robots which could help people in need. OK, so Theo, um, do you have time for one more question? Uh, yes, please. OK. Final question, final, final question. Do we really need to involve robotics, robots rather, and AI in every industry? For example, hospitality. Although robotics is helping many other industries like medicine, having robotics everywhere is unnecessary. Do you agree? It depends on the industry. Again, it depends on the specific application where the robot is being deployed on that industry. It's a multidimensional, you know, it's not just a single answer uh, to give uh, on this because there are many parameters to assess whether AI needs to be deployed on a specific industry for a particular problem or not. But uh, w one thing for sure that it won't happen in the industry is um, we don't want robots to take a decision on their own or dynamically learn a task. Uh, what we want in an industrial environment is robots that uh, solve problems precisely, accurately and repeatedly and still machine learning and deep learning can be used for those but the trained models can be deployed not dynamic learning which can result in unpredictable results thank yeah. you so okay. much for your talk okay. Theo. that's been fantastic i wish thank i had you. more time <laughs> Thank you very much to Jonathan for uh, so expertly shepherding the questions for this event. Thank you so much for joining us for the evening. Um, thank you for attendance. And and um, for those of you who want more information, please take, uh, take a look at our University of Salford website. Make sure you look for the North of England Robotics Innovation Centre, which is a new um, building, new structure and a new centre that's going to be formed that is being formed to support robotics in the whole of the northwest area area thank you ever so much and have a lovely evening